I think it must have been a decade ago when people started to comment that you'll happily leave home without your wallet, but you won't leave home without your phone. And our relationship with the phone has evolved. And it's also become, in a sense, an expression of our agency as humans. And so we built our first device called AI Pin, which is the first AI driven wearable computer. And it is totally standalone, which means it's not something that you pair to your phone. It actually is a standalone phone itself. And it involves a lot of amazing hardware, including a new kind of display, which is a laser projector, which projects onto the palm of your hand. The best ideas are driven by ambition and less by opportunity. And so if you set up yourself to actually look at what is the, the best thing for people to have um, versus how are you trying to exploit them? Hi there, I'm Azim Azar and welcome to another episode of the Exponential View podcast. My guest today will without question have impacted or touched every single one of your lives through their work in visceral ways, in emotional ways, in ways that empower us, and sometimes even frustrate us. Imran Chowdhury and Bethany Bongiorno are two former Apple executives who met while working as the firm was growing into its ascendancy. Imran was the director of design and amongst other projects was responsible for the groundbreaking interface and interactions of the iPhone. The ones that made our jaws drop a mere 15 years ago and today seem ever so quotidian. He made it possible for buttons to disappear and for smartphones to become usable through multi-touch. Bethany led software engineering at the firm and is behind the operating systems, iOS and MacOS, that are used so widely today. A few years ago, the pair left Apple and founded a new company called Humane, which launched its first product, the AI Pin, just last year. Bethany and Imran, welcome to the show. Thank you yeah. so much for having us. It is, it's wonderful to have you both. I was looking forward to this conversation so much that last night I started lucid dreaming about <laughs> things I wanted to ask you. You know, that moment where you're in that liminal space of your brain. And I, I was going through these bits of the conversation, a couple of which I will raise later in our discussion. And I did something that, of course, we do these days. We didn't do 20 <laughs> years ago. I broke one of my rules. I reached for my phone at about 2.45 in the morning, popped up notepad and quickly typed in what I could and then put the phone away and I managed to get back to bed. But I'm curious, it's such an important part of our lives. How does it feel to have been part of something that has led this momentous change in the everyday life of billions and billions of people? It's, it's an incredible thing to have been part of a team to work on such a profoundly impactful piece of technology. It had always been a dream of mine to be able to really impact how we use compute. So it's a blessing and a bit of a curse at the same time. Uh, I think technology affords so much, but when you actually create something that coexists with humans, you learn a lot and humans end up shaping the technology um, so much that uh, you need to be able to have that flexibility and just really refactor it a lot. And so I think that's really what the journey has been over the last 15 years is shaping, learning, and then um, readjusting. But it's, it's incredible to have been a part of a team to have done so much. Yeah. I will take us back down memory lane because in my hands and podcast listeners will not be able to see this, but they'll be able to imagine it. I have my first computer, which Imran, oh, yes. as a Brit, you will recognize. Yeah, absolutely. The Sinclair ZX81. Yeah. With it's wonky back RAM pack of 16 kilobytes. And, and I, I want to talk about computing, about where it came from and where it's going. I think the ZX81 was part of that first wave. Of course, the Apple II was out at the time yeah. uh, to try to democratize computing. How do you think about the evolution of that as a field and where compute have, have, have come from? I think the evolution of computing is, a, is an amazing journey. It started with the mainframes that calculated punch cards for efficiency sake, just really allowing us to process so much information. And then uh, it, it migrated to a, a table, something that became a lot smaller that we can actually start to bring into 
our offices and start to have those sort of smaller, more focused moments of efficiency in the workplace. And then it just really started to become more personal enough so that you could bring it into your living rooms and home offices. And that's when you started to see things like the Apple II and the Sinclairs and the BBC computers and th things like that. And there was so much, so much variety in terms of how you would input and start to think about what are the best ways that, that the people that were starting to use them could actually get the most out of them. And that's when you had keyboards evolve into other input mechanisms like mice. And so the mice really allowed for broader adoption through the graphical user interfaces of things like the Macintosh and the Amiga and things like Windows as well. And every single time you would do that, you would start to bring in more people into the conversation, more people that could truly understand the benefit of having efficient processing capabilities that would make whatever they were doing that much easier or that much more efficient. And I think when you started to see the desktops pervade over time, portability became a, a new thing. I think people could start to see the advantages of that. And I think it was luggability in those days, wasn't it? It was sort of <laughs> yeah. suitcase size and you needed That's a right. strong <laughs> shoulder to, to, to take them. That's right. And, and so I think the first portable that we had in our family was an IBM XT luggable with an amber display. I think it was about four inches, about this big or so. And I used to play flight simulator on that for hours on end. But it, it, it was the, the beginnings of what it meant to be able to pick up something from home or work and just be able to transport that, that, that back and forth. It's funny you mentioned Flight Simulator on the IBM XT because my mum bought an Apple II. So she was one of the first people I know to have two computers. She had an Apple II and she had this ZX81. But we were in Europe, so we had the Apple II Euro Plus, which had a slightly different ROM, which meant that it could play the game Lemonade Stand, but not Flight Simulator, which would crash <laughs> after two minutes. And I spent years trying to get this thing to run. But So I, I feel jealous. You, you got to play. H how about yeah. you, Bethany? You, you were a, a physicist by training. Can you remember the first time uh, you came across a computer and, and how you felt about it? Yeah, my parents were similar in terms of being really quick to adopt things and bring them into our home. I, I actually, the, the first time that I got a sense for what it meant to interact with a computer was actually an Atari that my dad had. And I remember he and I used to take things apart in the house and fix them. We had a pinball machine that would break a lot and my dad would help me learn how to fix it. And we actually created a system to allow us to just put one quarter in it like over and over again so we could keep playing it. And I think that a lot of that led to my curiosity about the world. And that's really where my joy for physics came from that ultimately landed me in Silicon Valley working for Apple. But it wasn't a direct path. I wasn't a kid who was very interested in, in computers outside of eventually the Dell computer that my parents brought into the home when I was younger. And I would play, play games on for hours on end. I was a huge writer and I would use it as a tool to write when I was younger. And, and really for me, it was more about curiosity about how the world worked. And, and that led me into studying physics and astrophysics. And really in astrophysics, you're not able to see really or touch things. You instead are looking at data and doing a lot of data analysis to pull understandings about the world from that data. And, and that ultimately led me to, to become a, a project manager building software tools that analyze data for clients and really helped them understand their customers, help them understand their issues internally, and ultimately make better decisions through data. And I did that for a while and, and helped build software there and really was super passionate about building consumer level tools. And I wanted to get more into consumer and really build things that had a bigger impact and something that you could own end to end and really be involved from the moment an idea happened all the way through the learnings like Imran mentioned, like putting it out in the world and then getting feedback and adapting to it. And that journey was really something I was super passionate about and ultimately landed me at Apple through an interview where I showed up and had a Blackberry and a suit and a PC 
and was very clear. I'm, I, I haven't really used Apple products at all, but I'm, I have an iPod and I'm super passionate about building products and learning what that product journey looks like. As a BlackBerry user, how did you feel when yes. uh, Imran and his team took the keyboard away? Because so the BlackBerry was the, famous for its keyboard and the double back BlackBerry yes. thumbs and... Absolutely. Yes. I, how, I, how was did a, you I was a massive, <laughs> yeah, Imran knows how I felt because I was very clear to in meetings with them. We get to work here at Humane with Ken Koshenda, who also worked at Apple, oh, sure. a partner, and I he have was very book. instrumental. He had a book the, a few years yes. ago, right? He yeah, did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's great, great. And he yeah. works, he, he's incredible and obviously worked on the keyboard and autocorrect and, and things like that at Apple. And my first project, actually, when I got to Apple was working with Imran and Ken on cut, copy, paste, which if you remember, didn't ship in the original iPhone, which was a travesty to many that they shipped this one product without cut, copy, paste. How could they do that? And I worked with them on the keyboard and cut, copy, paste and things like that. And I remember sitting in a meeting, potentially my first week or month at Apple with Ken and Imran. And I said, hey, outsider perspective here, this keyboard sucks. Like, I, I can't use it. It's really terrible. And I miss my BlackBerry. And I remember the, the temperature in the room got really cold and everyone was not really happy with my opinion about it. But I think ultimately having the ability to say that we knew people were struggling with it. And then a ton of effort went into creating incredible technology on the back end to make autocorrect something that feels very magical. But it took a while. Like there was a lot of work after the iPhone shipped to ultimately make it something like Imran mentioned before that welcomed in way more people into the ecosystem mm. because it was approachable yeah. for them. But, but it's a fascinating point that you make. It, it, it to speaks to the sense of um, interior confidence that a designer has to have about making a choice like this because it's not in the user surveys, right? It's about your own sense of what you want the product to be. Imran, in thinking about that as you as a designer, one of the things that always strikes me is you have to manage a gestalt in your head, like a holistic view of a product while obsessing over the details, while also being able to stay true to some kind of vision in the face of what seem like really terrible decisions, like not having cut and copy and paste. So how, how does that, right. it, I'm going to ask you to look inside your the black box that's your head, right? How does that process emerge for you? Because I think that's quite key to the humane journey as well. Yeah, I, I think to begin with, you, you have to have this desire uh, or this ambition that's really driven by something that, that wants to create something that's better. And, and I, th I think when, at least when it comes to compute, my passion for compute and, and my understanding of compute is quite journeyed. And I do have a good sense of where things need to go. And oftentimes that comes with certain types of compromises. Those compromises could be how much time we have, what our understanding of something is, our ability to execute just to something that might be good enough in that moment. But there's this relentless desire to want that, that, to really want to make something that's better than exists today and to really be able to shape that and to understand what kind of editing along the way, like at the time, cut, copy, paste, could actually create the best experience. And so I think with things like that, you have to be really comfortable to say that what you have right now is good enough for people to experience and that where it needs to go in order to make it better. And then by the time that they catch up with that emotion or that feeling or that, that ability or frustration to want that, you better have released that, that aspect or that feature to do that. And that's one of the most beautiful things about software experiences is that in software and hardware that runs on top of software, you can create a world that doesn't exist. And, mm. and, and that's, I think, is one of the most malleable and most powerful things about being uh, a designer in this space is that you can imagine something and and bring it into an existence that that literally wouldn't have happened had you not been inspired to do so. i'd like to pick up on this this sense of delivering something that the user hasn't experienced before because we've established psychological relationships with our phone it's beyond the the sense of need i think it must have been a decade ago when people started to comment that you'll happily leave home without your wallet but you won't leave home 
without your phone. And our relationship with the phone has evolved. And it's also become, in a sense, an expression of our agency as humans. How do you think about that in terms of the responsibility that you know you have as the designer? Because I think that relationship with compute that we've talked about was about democratization and greater access, which we've certainly seen. But something perhaps that we may not have seen was also the extent to which this would not merely be a bicycle for the mind. It would be uh, the thing that connects us to the economy, the thing that allows us to express ourselves personally and creatively. Yeah, absolutely. We've gotten to a point where our dependencies on computers are as integral as the air that we breathe and the electricity that powers our cities. It's that critical. And I think it's that vibration over many years that's really called into that kind of existence where it's become incredibly personal. It is the way that we meet people now. It's the way that we actually establish our, our relationships and, and grow them over time. It's the way that we navigate our cities. It's how we form our thoughts. And I think it, it's what's really powerful about that is that we're at that point where we understand that compute is part of our everyday lives, right? And that, that we all as a global society really understand the power of a network connected a computer that can actually live alongside us. And I think the question that we have been asking here at Humane over the last few years is if we could take a step back and look at what that relationship ought to look like, how would we um, think about the evolution of that? And that, I think, really comes from the, the, the psychological relationship, as you're bringing up, the, the dependencies, and what are things that, um, if we could come up with a far better way of interacting with compute, would actually become alleviated, some of the frustrations that we might have, and what types of new things, new capabilities would open up if we could actually start to look at new ways of doing things. Mm. And that's a thesis behind how we've been approaching it. Again, it's just that pursuit of just a better coexistence, of just really embracing the fact that compute is, an, is a foregone conclusion, that we at Humane are incredibly passionate about compute, and we want more of it, and we really want to just make it more omnipresent in, right. in many ways. Well, I, I can see that Bethany are on has got a Humane pin on her the lapel of her jacket right now. So why don't you introduce it to us, this is the ne the next step in the evolution, as as you both believe. W what is the pin? Describe it to us, and what can it do? We started with the belief that we needed to essentially build a new OS and have it be as a, an operating system, and have there be a we call the software the soul of the product. Have the soul be something that's AI driven, and. The reason that needs to exist now or why we feel that's so important now is because it is about reducing the friction, like Imran mentioned, in terms of how we use the computers in our life. So we know that we have this 15-year uh, experience using computers that are app-driven, right? If you want to use a new experience, you have to, one, know that new experience exists. I have to know a new app is available that maybe solves a problem that I have. Mm -hmm. I have to go then search, know the name of it, search for it, download it, log in, figure out how to navigate this new app UI that I maybe have never used before, and then be create a relationship with this company and then start using it. And right. So a that's of, a sort of, that's the existing paradigm, right? That we all have. That's the existing I have so paradigm. many pages of apps on my phone, 20 pages yes. of apps. Yes. And, and what have you got there though? Because you've got a completely different form factor now. That's the, the proposition, right? <laughs> the idea is that if we built this entire new operating system that was without apps and was driven using AI, what kind of hardware would we want to build to uh, allow you to unlock all of the capabilities of it? And so what is the right design? What is the right form factor? Which essentially means what is the right way to interact with it? What kind of hardware would you need in it to allow you to get the context? So that's the things I see, the things I hear, the things I tell it. How does it get the right context to help you access that in a way that's 
involves less friction. And so we built our first device called AI Pin, which is the first AI driven wearable computer. And it is totally standalone, which means it's not something that you pair to your phone. It actually is a standalone phone itself. And it involves a lot of amazing hardware, including a new kind of display, which is a laser projector, which projects onto the palm of your hand. And what that allows you to do is get a uh, display when you need it, and then the display disappears when you don't need it. You put up your hand, it projects on your hand the information you need, you put your hand down and the display disappears. And really this is about the hardware essentially disappearing and allowing you to be more present in the world and get the same access to compute that, that you expect today. Yeah, and, and I think I'll add that the reason why it's critical for the hardware to be shaped in a way that it can disappear is that if, if you go back to what we were talking about earlier, the, the evolution of compute, it, it really starts from the, the input mechanism for, for compute. And if you look at the early days of compute, you're really looking at remote entry, keyboards and mice, and the smartphones and tablets brought on and the work that my team and I did at the time brought on the era of direct manipulation. Mm -hmm. So where you could actually go in and manipulate a lot of the elements so that they, you were literally touching your data and such. And, and this new era that, that we think is really interesting is ushering in a, the era of ambient compute. And that's different than remote or um, direct or even spatial compute, which I think the, the, the key difference there is that ambient is the first time that you're able to uh, remove the this sort of necessity of the screen to be involved in the input. Uh, and that's slightly different than spatial, because right now we're at a point where direct manipulation has actually plateaued in terms of what you're able to do with it. There's very little innovation there. And so there's right. like a, almost a fork in the road at the moment. There, there is this fork, right? So the fork is, and it's funny, we're recording this on the day that the Apple Vision Pro ships to the first uh, customers in, in the US. And there, we are having this conversation. It's about the fork in the road. There is ambient or invisible computing on the one hand, which I guess is the, the, the bet you're taking. And then there's immersive spatial computing on the other hand, which is the, the, the way that you know companies like Meta and Apple are picking up. But one of the things that I picked up in your discussion was that you really started, you started from the software side of the interactions rather than the physical form factor. And just to describe the device, I think it's two and a half inches by one and a half inches or something like that. It's beautiful, right? We've got a world-class designer on designers in the team. Of course, it's going to be elegant. Uh, but it was quite curious to me that you started with the um, the, the, the sort of software that drives the experience. You actually touched on the business model right up front, which yeah. was no apps, um, which le leads to, to more questions. So is that a deliberate part of the, of, of the narrative about how you think about designing this experience? It is. I think with anything, you have to really go back to the, the impact and why you're doing something. The best ideas are driven by am ambition and less by opportunity. And so if you set up yourself to actually look at what is the, the best thing for people to have versus how are you trying to exploit them? Mm. There's a different, there's a different narrative that, that arrives when you set your intention to be something that is really more about how do you move things forward versus keeping people locked in. And I think when you start to look at the issues with direct manipulation is that the, the cognitive load of direct manipulation is so profoundly isolating that you essentially experience tunnel vision. And then, right. So you're are... describing so the, the idea of my sitting over my screen, trying to find the right app, trying to find the right button on the app. And it's more elegant than a keyboard and a mouse and having to be able to desk, but it still takes me away from where I am. Right, absolutely. Because there, there's an enmeshing that happens with the input mechanism and the screen. And, and then you're entirely involved in that entire use, usage. So um, it takes you away. And, and then naturally the, the spatial compute, which is essentially an extension of that, allows for more of that to happen in a immersed way. And I think when we started to think about how do we actually evolve to a point where we can start to interact with the world around you, then it really started to go back to, let's go back to the fundamentals and look at the operating system 
and look at how, how the operating system can come in and out of these interactions so that it actually frees you from the burden of actually being able to use the computer manually so that there's a bit of an automation that happens uh, in, in, that these intelligent systems mm. can be in operation when you kick them off and they can do these actions for you so that you don't have to. I mean, this idea that you can it can do the interaction so you don't have to comes back to a point I think that Bethany, you were making, which is you talk about this as being a sort of AI first platform. And over the past five years, we've seen this sort of significant in, enhancements in some of the technologies that you would need to do this. So speech recognition is dramatically better. Large language models have made it much easier for computers to, to string things together, understand what we're saying, and potentially with a bit of sort of string and sealing wax, conduct action. So could you just talk a little bit about how important those AI technologies are, the timing of their maturity, and everyone needs to know, is there an LLM somewhere at the back of this? And because that's yeah. the 64XX question. Yeah, so when we started building Humane and really started um, formalizing the team around it and beginning to build in 2018, you're right in saying a lot of the technology wasn't there yet, but Imran believed and knew that eventually it would be and that this was the direction where the industry was going and that these were things that were going to be quickly available on the horizon some of these technologies we also knew we would have to build in-house. Some of them we believed and we knew we would be pulling from others who are building great technologies. It's one of the benefits of Humane being an independent company. We see our device and platform as something that is going to be the platform where we can work with many people, many LLMs. It's not just about one singular LLM. It's about building a flexible platform that can work with all of them. And I think that is ultimately what the customer wants. And I think that is the reason we're building this at Humane, because we know we have that flexibility as an independent company to, to, to work with all of them. And I think for us, it was about building a platform for the technologies that both existed and the ones that we knew were coming uh, and, and being prepared with the device that we knew could unlock experiences, both ones that we can build now and ones that will be available at the end of the year or next year um, when new technologies right. are available. And so Imran really saying, if, I, if this is the world in which I wanna live in five years, what do I have to build now to be prepared for that? What are the key things that would feed into a, a platform that could support those experiences? I saw Sam Altman speak at Davos a few weeks ago, and he came up with a, a great analogy about LLMs. And I think Sam is one of your investors. He said the way to think about the progression of these GPTs is a little bit like the iPhone. The iPhone, the first iPhone was an amazing device. But if you look at it today, it isn't an amazing device. Uh, and But at some point, we can't say when it, it changed, right? It just, things came together. And I was thinking about that in the context of the AI pin. And um, this is really iPhone 1 territory, right? What does what, what would AI pin 5 look like? What would AI pin 7 look like? What could we expect from it? Yeah, I think uh, iPhone 1 was in, in some ways a, a, a miraculous device in in terms of what it was able to to do and achieve but the thing that it really did was it tilled the fields for um, the appropriate sprouts to emerge and really create a space for direct manipulation compute in a way that uh, no other device did and and it was really good at doing effectively that and I think AI PIN is essentially the same in that way, that it offers the promise of uh, ambient compute that really allows you to, to achieve a level of presence while still being connected. And it gives you a level of freedom, which is um, really enabled by the operating system that Bethany was mm. saying, the autonomy aspect. And if you just go back and you look at some of the positioning that we had originally for iPhone, there was two vectors. We had one that was ease of use, and then one that was smart. And this, uh, as, as we just spoke about earlier, is that this came about uh, during a landscape of Blackberries, Nokias, and Moto phones that were neither smart or easy to use. And in this day and age, everything is somewhat smart 
that everything has to be easy to use. And what people really need and have been and demanding in many ways is a, a level of presence and a coexistence mm-hmm. that really liberates them. And so I think that's always going to be a through line for our operating system and AI pin. And so when you start to think about what evolution looks like over time, it's the enablement of more of those types of things. It's the it's the inclusion of more areas in your life that and that that could include intelligent compute. We envision over time we have uh, some partners that that really want to work with us on things like enabling AI pin to work in real time surgeries, for example, where the the compute has the capability to use as optical sensors, then also connect with greater databases so that they can be faster decision-making in that moment. Right. And I think those types of capabilities are things that you will start to see when you start to really look at more powerful compute, more mm. powerful sensors that will enable just the baseline of where AI pen is in spirit. So similar, very similar. And one of the things that came out with, with the smartphone ecosystem was that we developed apps, right? Independent apps. And that's the way that we directly m- manipulate the system to get what we we want. I hit the kayak app or I hit the Uber app yeah. uh, and I go down that route. So one of the things I was curious about was without an app e- ecosystem, what hu- the Humane OS needs to do is it needs to be able to pause what I'm asking it and then go to the correct underlying resource, which I, I guess is going to be an API for now. And, and, it, and I'm going to ask one of these questions that interviewers should never ask because there are so many parts to it. So please feel free to pick apart the one piece uh, that you want. If I was a good designer, I would have edited it down to the essentials. <laughs> there seems to be then a question of how do I trust the resource that you're going to go to? When I'm on my smartphone, I know I'm hitting the Uber app because I see it's Uber app and it's been verified by the app store. But what many users don't realize is when they go to their smartphone and there's a default search engine on the the web browser, it's not there because it's the best. It's there because it's paying billions of dollars to be there. And there's this question of trust. How am I going to trust when I ask my humane pin to make a booking at a hotel that you've gone to a legitimate place, that you've got me the the, the, the price that's best for me, not the relationship that's best for you as a a business? I guess, Bethany, you're, you're thinking through all of these questions, right? Yeah, and, and um, I think that there's some things that over time we will learn about your preferences. So if in the case, let's use ride sharing as an example. Once we bring ride sharing onto the AI pin and onto Cosmos, there, there's a world where you are able to tell us that you have a preference. So you may be a staunch Uber user and that's what you prefer, great. We'll learn your preferences and then you don't have to worry. You can trust every time you call a car, it's the right kind of car because you've already told us this is your preference for this type of a vehicle and this service. There's also a world where we enable you to provide us with some parameters. So maybe you are in a moment where you're okay with any of the services that are on our platform, but you just want the fastest. Get me the fastest car. Get me the cheapest car. Get Mm -hmm. me the nicest car, right? So these are things that, again, going back to Imran's point, of we we do want to put you back in control. We do want to create, fix some of the issues when it comes to balance and and having you feel like you're in control. Um, And these are things that we can do either via learning about you and your preferences and your AI essentially on our OS doing that um, or giving you choice and having transparent choice where you essentially drive it in that way. Uh, But it it all happens in like a very natural language way where you can say, I just want to get there in the quickest way possible or the cheapest way possible. One of the key aspects of these design choices ends up being a business model, right? And I think the pin is $700. You have said in other discussions that you have a, you've got a positive margin on that and that you, there's a $25, $24 a month data and phone subscription as as well, which presumably has a, a bit of a margin over it as well. Does the business model require the thing that we've all got used to, right, which is the internet tax, the X percent that goes to Meta or the X percent that goes to Amazon or Apple or Alphabet? Does your business model require that? Do you think that that's still helpful for the consumer that that manages the trust or are you okay without it? 
It is a requirement. I think there's, there's some things that really are enabled when you have a, more of a curated experience uh, versus one that is an advertising experience. Um, you know, that I think there's a level of pollution and, and as you say, a, a, a level of randomness that happens when you have something that is, is, is free. And the reality is that it's not really free. You're giving away a lot of your data uh, as a result and, and you have no idea what's happening with your data or how you might be profiled and, and then later on exploit it. I think one of the key pieces of our business model that's really important to, to talk about is that in, in our world, uh, every humane customer owns their data and they have they have the ability to essentially view and understand and, and remove and do whatever they want with their data. And that's a, a very different conceit than other business models. And I think there is some security that comes with that, that for most people, I think is, is, is a bit worth paying for right now, uh, quite honestly. Yeah, I, th- I think there's something interesting that happens there, which is that AI becomes part of the mediation layer between us and the things that we want to we want to get done. And right now, it's reasonably clumsy. You've got these tools on ChatGPT where you can call a third party service, and that it's very early days, so we can yeah. acknowledge where where it is. Yeah. And I think the third party services haven't had a chance to necessarily adapt their own kind of contractual API relationships to to deal with AI driven queries. But I was curious about one of the um, uh, design challenges, which is, um, and I'll I'll describe this in terms of my Spotify listening. If I don't, if I can't browse the phone, I find it really hard to discover new music because I can only remember the last three tracks in my head, one of which is always Dire Straits. And then increasingly in recent years, Spotify has introduced these playlists that are curated for me. And they give me much less discovery than I used to get. So I actually use like Cobars and Tidal as well because I like my music. So I, I go off and find music in, in, from those platforms too. So, so I'm curious about whether there's a new style of cognitive load that comes in when it comes to serendipity or remembering all the things that I can do with, without the cues. Is that a real design and interact, or interaction challenge? Or, and if it is, how do you address it? Yeah, it's an excellent question. One of the amazing things about having something like a contextual computer is that um, you can involve the compute in whatever you're doing. And so there's a, an amazing experience that I had over the holidays where I asked to play some music, I asked for a particular artist, and it, because it was on Christmas Day, it played the Christmas versions of that artist which was really great and it's exactly what I was looking for in that moment and I think there's something to be said about understanding you understanding your context in the moment and understanding um, uh, what's actually available uh, there there's 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 something that emerges out of that becomes a new behavior in terms of how you might be finding music we're used to finding music right now that um, comes from browsing, and that browsing comes from how we've actually been browsing our record libraries, right? Where there's just individual things that are sequenced out. You're going through your records or your CDs or box of tapes. And as designers, we've used those as metaphors to create these new types of views within those app windows, right? So you have squarish views that really resemble the album art that we're all used to and a lot of that is 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 quite slow and labored if you know the the music that you want to you can ask for money for nothing and you'll get that immediately but if there's a if there's a dinner party that's happening and that we can understand that then you might hear sultans of swing just in that moment it's a great choice. Telegraph Road too. Uh, yeah. Underrated, but you need good headphones for that. I think I'll just come to the question for you. So when we spoke a few days ago, you talked uh, about compassionate computing, and it was really the first time I'd heard that phrase. And I would love to understand better what you mean by compassionate uh, computing. Is this a step up from trusted computing, which was a st- step up from secure computing? And if it is, how does it manifest itself either in hardware, the way trust has secure enclaves, or in terms of business metrics, right? Something that you could measure. For me, it, it comes down to meeting you where you are and 
adapting to you versus you having to adapt to it. <clears throat> and I think that comes in a couple different forms, but the one that is the most powerful for me is really in the way that you can speak to it and the way that you navigate it. And Imran mentioned an example of being able to find music um, in a way that reduces the burden and the friction and the mental load. And for me with music, it's about being able to talk to my computer in a way that feels very human. I'm, I'm feeling this way. I want to hear something that kind of sounds like this, but maybe it has pieces of this in it that maybe samples this type of artist. That is a very complicated query and ask, but Ultimately, if I'm sitting next to somebody and I'm talking to a human and I'm saying, hey, do you have any recommendations that something sounds like this, but it has a little bit of this in it, that's a very human interaction and is something that I feel really proud that our OPEN and the AI PIN do a really good job of, of creating a platform that's accessible by a lot of people. And we talked last time about our experiences watching kids use our device, so five, six-year-olds who can speak to it in language that is very comfortable, right? They can mispronounce words, miss words, maybe take long pauses or maybe even stutter in between words and it still understands their intent. It's very compassionate in that way. And we've also seen people who are much, much older who maybe have some similar issues, whether it's issues with mobility or speech, that the system ultimately, ultimately can understand what their intent is. And to me, that that is about building an OS and a device that, that meets you where you are and it's all about reducing friction and it's all about making things easier and allowing you to just think. And as soon as you can think about something and talk it out and think it through, we can help you act on it. And I think um, that's really important. Fantastic. So one last question, which I'd love to put to Imran. So you're going to have pins in the hands of lots of people over the coming uh, months and year. What's a use you would love to, to see that would make you feel we've ta we're taking the right steps forward in the way that, you know, the beauty about producing computing devices is you never know how your end user is going to enjoy them. So what would make you smile? When people start to find better ways to coexist with um, compute and they're happier in moments, whether it's a phone call or they just feel like they're um, sleeping better or that they have um, an ability to keep up with the amount of information that they're constantly bombarded with or that they feel as if uh, they can just really focus on being able to communicate with people that they've never really been able to communicate before. Yeah. I think for me, when I travel these days, just being able to speak with everybody is such an amazing unlock for me with our language translation capabilities. Mm. It's profoundly changed right. the way I, I move through the world. How about you, Bethany? Now, you can't say your, you want your BlackBerry keyboard back. We have to uh, <laughs> say that no. is not an option for you. What would you love to, to see in the last sort of 30 seconds that we have? Yeah, I think the big thing is navigating the world for me. Imran mentioned our, the, our interpreter feature, which allows you to speak 50 languages. I want to be able to bring that into the real world. What does that say, whether it's in a different language or I just can't read it. It's too small. It's too far away. Allowing it to help me understand the world around me. What's going on with that over there? What is that restaurant? Tell me more about this place and really about being present in the world around me, but allowing me to navigate in a better way, both places and people is really something that I'm super passionate about. At the end of the day, it's going to be your users who are going to surprise all of us over the coming coming years. Absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you, Bethany yes. and Imran, for, for taking the time today. Thank you. It's so fun to talk to you about this. Thank you. Thank you.